Hello and welcome to the Agri History Podcast. In this episode, we'll cover Dr. Kevin Folta and his breeding history with strawberries and various genetic histories and whatnot. So, Dr. Folta, would you like to introduce yourself? Well, sure, yeah. My name is Kevin Folta. I'm a professor at the University of Florida. I uh, do work with uh, strawberries and strawberry genetics to some degree. And then we also work with light and the way that light changes plant traits. And also work with a very interesting project in how we can create new compounds that are biologically active from random genetic information. And it's a really fascinating project. Uh, I also do a lot of work in science communication, which is really a significant passion of mine and how we connect with the public to get them more excited about technology. Sounds good. Uh, maybe you can start with uh, the flavor genes and how you discover different types of grapey and peachy genes you mentioned in a few of your interviews in the past. Well, the question really is, are strawberries broken? Right. And I think a lot of people would agree that there is some room for improvement, that if you're putting sugar on them or you're adding uh, adding them to other food and realizing they're not giving you the flavor that they maybe once did, uh, maybe there's something missing from strawberries. And that's uh, the central question that we sought to resolve, because if you go into wild populations, you can find berries that are much more aromatic. So what happened? What happened was plant breeding and the objectives of, of the industry were we want bigger berries and more of them. They have to ship longer and the plants have to be resistant to disease. That was the request and plant breeders did a great job at meeting it. They didn't do such a great job at doing that while keeping the flavors and aromas. And so we set out to figure out how do we go back and find those flavors and aromas and the genes that are responsible for them and eventually reintroduce them to the commercial strawberry. So uh, where do you find the specific genes and how did you, how did you identify them? Yeah, what's really interesting is that the, the genes for the, those novel flavors and aromas do exist in wild material, but they also exist in a few cultivated varieties. So if you take a standard strawberry that's missing some of its flavors and you go back and look at um, some of the, they think of them maybe as heirloom, but really as really old varieties. The older varieties do tend to have some of these unusual flavors. A good example is this one called methylanthranilate, which is a uh, grape flavor. It's the flavor of artificial grape soda. It's the flavor of artificial grape medicine. It's um, a fruity flavor. <clears throat> it's also found in grapes. <laughs> so that's where it comes from. But strawberries make a little bit of this. And when strawberries are making little notes of peach and little notes of grape and little notes of um, other flavors, they come together to give the flavor of strawberry. And our brain interprets that as this is a strawberry. So we were able to find a uh, variety called Mara de Bois, which was a uh, one variety which has a lot of this compound called methyl anthranilate. And when you compared the genes that were turned on in the fruit in, in in Mara and some of its progeny that were producers of methyl anthranilate and compare that against the regular commercial strawberry, you were able to find specific genes or really just a couple of genes which were responsible for that flavor note. And so it works really well. We're able to use um, RNA sequencing. If, if you'd like to know more about the technology, I'm glad to talk about that too. Could you go into that a little bit? Well, basically you're able to take a fruit and take a snapshot of, of what are the genes that are turned on right now. So what you do is you look for a fruit that's producing the flavors and then take purify out the RNA. So that intermediate between the gene and the protein and purify the RNA. And if the RNA is there, the RNA says that the gene is turned on. And what we look for are the different pieces of RNA that represent different genes. And what we were able to find is that in the variety called Mara de Bois, we would find a gene for methyl anthranilate um, synthesis that was turned on, that was not turned on in a variety called Eliana, which is a, a one that doesn't have the grape flavor. The flip side was true. We were able to find a gene that was present in or a, a transcript, an RNA molecule that was present in something called 
um, that was in, in Eliana that was not present in Mara de Bois. That encodes a gene called gamma deck, or uh, a gene that um, the gene itself is a uh, is a uh, fatty acid desaturation gene. That long story, but it makes it a peach aroma called gamma decalactone. So we're able to identify these uh, specific molecules, which are, tell us that there's likely to be a presence or absence of a given fruit volatile. And then that's what makes our fruit more fruity. Excellent. Now on your live exper experiments, uh, you mentioned that uh, in our interview that uh, lichen influence the different flavor traits a little bit. So uh, how does it happen and how does it can you apply that to strawberries? Well, it happens in a lot of ways. So the main thing to think about is that sugars and other types of molecules that accumulate in fruit are starting with light, right? Through photosynthesis. So to have fruit have sweetness, you need to have some uh, photosynthate, which comes from the sun. But different qualities of light, different colors of light do this differently. And what we wanted to test is, can you change the flavor of a fruit by putting it into a different light environment. And it works with some fruits. And we were able to show that in strawberries, you could significantly change specific, the presence of specific chemicals by putting it into different colors or different qualities of light. It works really well. And the reason it worked well was because a fruit is still metabolically active and still paying attention to the cues from coming from the environment. And so that allowed us to uh, identify the specific compounds that would uh, or specific treatments that would increase the level of certain compounds. So uh, could you go into some more detail about what types of light use and how the flavors were, were affected using different types of lights? Well, it's, it's, um, it's more prevalent in other, um, other vegetable or especially herbs. So herbs that produce a lot of volatiles, things like cilantro or uh, basil, they produce a lot of chemicals that volatilize. They, they, it, when you chew them, they move up behind your nose and stimulate olfactory receptors that inform the brain of what you're eating. So we can change the level of those chemicals by changing the light that is being applied to the plant. We can use different wavelengths of blue to make cilantro taste almost like like just beyond cilantro flavor, very strong cilantro flavor. We can make basil taste more like basil. And that's exciting because it gives us the idea that at retail or maybe at home, we could grow plants under specific lights that would give us um, better tasting food. And better tasting food, especially with fruits and vegetables, means people eat more of it and there's less waste and healthier food. So that's a really exciting edge of this particular project. So would the uh, far blue, would the blue light uh, affect all herbs the same way or would it vary from light, from species to species and light to light? Yeah, it likely varies from species to species and even from variety to variety. So we know that certain kinds of um, certain kinds of strawberries respond differently than others. And that's just the way that, that we understand that fruits are different varieties because they're different genetically. And so they aren't necessarily going to respond the same way to a light treatment. It's a, it means that we have a lot more work to do. It's good job security. And uh, you know, we, we have a, we'll have to continue to test all the different varieties. But the best thing to do would be, could we create varieties that we know respond to red or blue and essentially give somebody a programmable plant that if you want to produce more of the basil flavor, you put it in blue. If you want it to taste more like cilantro, put it in red. That's something that may be very feasible. Now you mentioned that uh, you can use different types of light to influence flavors. So uh, when it comes to strawberries, is there any way to use the light to up amplify the grape flavor chemical or the peach flavor chemical? Uh, not, we haven't done that too much with light. Um, we've been mostly focusing on how you allow the flavor to be there based on genetics. So by just crossing plants that have the, those genes with ones that don't, creating the next generation of plants that do have them. So it was kind of funny, the parents, one had grape, one had peach. Well, now we were able to combine the two together into one genetic background, just, but we're uh -huh. just with crossing them together. So uh, 
You mentioned that you can use random DNA samples to improve flavor, I think. So do you want to go into that a little bit? Well, we can't do, uh, we haven't done anything with flavor with random DNA, but the question always was, could you take a random DNA sequence, put that into a plant or a bacterium or whatever, and create a molecule that biology has never encountered before. And if you do that, what are the consequences for plants in that scenario? So in other words, you it's kind of like throwing monkey wrenches into a machine. Eventually, one of them sticks in the gears. And what we've been able to identify are new molecules that likely will serve as the next generation of um, herbicides. Um, new chemistries that help us understand new places of how you kill a plant or a bacterium. And that's really important because with uh, fewer herbicides, fewer antibiotics, we need things that are stronger, safer, and more specific. And I think that's where we have a very good opportunity to solve some problems. So uh, what are some examples of this method being used to build something new? Uh, what you've experimented with some of these things where one of your experiments, can you describe one of them? Well, we, we've mostly focused just on proof of concept. Our main thing has been, can we identify a molecule that has a specific effect on plants? And one of the ones we found uh, changes the way a seedling responds to red light. It changes the way the seedling responds. It doesn't change the way the mature plant responds. So it's very specific to a certain time in the plant's life and to a specific uh, part of the plant. It's to the, specific to the upper stem and the uh, young leaves, and that's it. So it tells us that we can create molecules that have very specific sites of influence. And this is exciting because we have so many that we've identified that are lethal. The problem is studying lethality is very difficult. You, you know, when you kill a plant, it's hard to study. You, you know, you, you, you kill it, it's hard to tell what's different biologically because it's dead. Makes sense. So on a, on that topic of where you uh, altered the you add some DNA into the mix and you change the way a ceiling behaves on the red light, uh, what type of species was used for that process? Well, that's used uh, something called Arabidopsis, Arabidopsis staliana. It's a laboratory plant. And the reason we use that is because it's very easy to introduce new genes and uh, disrupt genes. So that's why we use that particular plant. It has a very fast um, uh, uh, lifespan. It's, it, it's, uh, it germinates and dies inside of eight to 10 weeks and produces seed very quickly. So it's an excellent genetic model. All right, so uh, how did you genetically transform the plant? Was it using traditional techniques using just random genes or just well, we, using uh, larger sequences using a different technology? Well, we use a very um, tried and true technology called agrobacterium mediated transformation. So agrobacterium is a naturally occurring soil bacterium that through part of its lifespan injects DNA into a plant cell and it and that's what it does. Scientists have used this capacity of agrobacterium to uh, inject in the gene that we care about. So and to introduce the gene that we want to see expressed. So instead of it putting in genes for the bacteria, the bacteria does the work for us. And it's a very simple process in Arabidopsis. You just dip the flowers in agrobacterium and the agrobacterium goes in and, and does the does the genetic exchange and then a few of the seedlings in the next generation will be positive for the introduced gene thank you so what type of genes do you use? just you just grab a ram gene from anywhere from a ram spot on the on the parent plant or no it's it's not random genes it's random dna so it's just random a's g's c's and t's so all of DNA is made up of four basic molecules. We put them in a random order and insert it. And it's all ah. almost random. It's not quite random, but it does have a profound effect on how plants can survive. And it's a rather high number that actually show an effect. So it says that we may be able to really uh, uh, harvest a significant number of uh, novel molecules using this technique. So it stop me if I'm getting this wrong. You grab a bunch of ramp pieces of DNA, you stick them together, 
and then you shove them into agrobacterium and then put use that agrobacterium to send it into Rhabdopsis seeds, basically. Is that correct? Close. Yeah, the, the, the first step is just synthesized in a random way. So you, the A, G, C, and T are synthesized in a specific way where uh, the order is not reflecting anything we know. It just is whatever goes in next goes in next. And there's ways that we've done that. But it, the bottom line is, is that it's a sequence that likely never exerted or never existed in the universe and produces a peptide, so a small protein that never existed in the universe. And now it's present in the plant and the plant has to say, OK, well, how do I deal with this molecule? Most of the time, nothing happens. It just is there. It gets degraded. But occasionally it sticks in the gears of the plant and causes an effect. And that's what's pretty exciting. So uh, how will this be used in the manufacture of new types of pesticides? Well, the, the most important thing it does is it identifies new vulnerabilities. So if you want to know how to disable, um, you know, an airliner, you know, or a car or whatever, you could, if you, if you stick a screwdriver in the side of the door, it's not going to stop the engine. You got to know where you stick that screwdriver in order to, to stop the engine from running. You know where exactly you can you know jam it into the distributor or just jam it into the you know fan blades or whatever you have to have a specific place that it will be most effective and that's what we're learning here we're simply putting in molecules that are upsetting the biology we don't know how we don't really care all we know is that right now we're finding ways to disrupt biology and once we find disrupt the disruption we can identify how that disruption is occurring and then other people who are in chemistry can design similar molecules to do a similar thing to intervene in that spot so all we're doing is creating an, a new random puzzle piece that fits somewhere into the machine thank you uh so let me Let's get in a little bit, a little bit deeper. Uh, when you synthesize DNA, what type of methods do you use? Well, your your audience may be familiar with PCR. So PCR is what they call polymerase chain reaction. It's a uh, the thing that they use, the test they use to identify a molecule at a crime scene. So when you find a cigarette butt, you can amplify the uh, the person's DNA from that or off of a back of a postage stamp or um, off of uh, something they touch or a piece of hair. It's an amplification technique. So what we did was we gave the PCR reaction. Um, think of it this way. Every story starts with um, once upon a time and ends with happily ever after, right? And what happens in the middle, if you just put in random words, one time now and then you're going to have a story. What we're doing is we're giving the plant a molecular once upon a time and happily ever after. We're giving the beginning and the end of a molecule and then mixing the middle. And then when the PCR amplification happens, it amplifies in a way that it produces random sequence in between those two uh, predetermined ends. And so it says, here's the start, here's the end and the stuff in the middle, whatever it is. And it, that's why it works as well as it does. Excellent. So uh, have you found, can, going back to strawberry genetics, have you found any new interesting traits just looking at some of the wild specimens? Well, there's a lot of interesting things in wild strawberry. Um, the, probably the most important things we could look at would be questions of resistance to disease because you find strawberries that are growing in the, um, you know, like in Oregon, you can find them growing in the sand dunes by the ocean and they're big healthy plants that make fruit but they never get a drop of water from a hose or from irrigation and they never get an ounce of fertilizer. They don't get disease. So there's something in the wild material that's just like lost flavor, lost the resilience to, um, to those kinds of problems. So it's, it certainly is something that we can work on and, and make, some, make some progress. Excellent, and continue on the strawberry track. Uh... When it comes to day neutral strawberries, I learned that the day neutral trait came from a strain, I believe, in Oregon, a wild uh, Virgin Virginianum strain. Uh, yeah. You know what type of gene or genes caused that trait to happen? Yeah, they pretty much have looked at this. So the um, there's a couple of wild accessions which are day neutral. 
Um, they are Fregaria virginiana, which is one of the grandparents of mo modern day strawberry. And um, the uh, trait is, um, encodes a form of a repressor of flowering. So in other words, flowering is a tightly constrained process. You don't want to flower at the wrong time because you it's good to outcross. And so it's good to have whole populations synchronized when they're flowering. So bees can move pollen from one place to another. Um, but uh, if you take out the brakes, so think of it like, you know, you step on the gas and you flower, you step on the brakes, you don't flower. If you have brakes that are stopping it from flowering and then those are mutated, that gene is changed. Uh, in this case, it's a repressor of flowering that is mutated. And you see the same repressor changed in roses that are ever bearing. And that's a very similar, actually roses and strawberries are highly related. So the two um, both have the same mutation in that repressor. Thank you. Uh, continuing on, I'm hoping that I'm not going out too far out of your wheelhouse, but when it comes to, there, I have been hearing about crossbreeding between different species of strawberry. Uh, like uh, Fragaria vesca and Fragaria moschetta, I think is how it's pronounced. Yeah, moschetta. Yeah, moschetta is a uh, hexaploid, so it has three entire sets of genomes. So, uh, what type of new things you think will happen when you crossbreed these groups together? Yeah, yeah well, but that—that's what's been happening naturally for a long time, and humans are just aiding in the process. That when you cross vesca with moschetta. Your, which Vesca is a diploid, Moshada is a hexaploid. So that means you're probably going to come up with something in between, probably a tetraploid, which four sets of chromosomes. Um, and so, well, three, uh, it, it, it's a very interesting thing. We get a set of chromosomes from mom, a set from dad. That's Fregaria Vesca, set from mom, set from dad. Uh, Moshada gets three from mom, three from dad. And so it makes things a little bit more complicated. The offspring of Vesca by Moshada would likely have four sets, which two from mom, two from dad. So the, the beauty of that is Moshada is a very strong plant, a robustly growing plant, and it makes a very unusual flavor. It makes that um, um, methylanthranilate very well. So it makes a number of aroma compounds that give it a very musky, strong um, scent that some people really like, and it's a very novel flavor. Has there been an experiments with with that making a te tetraploid, doubling the chromosomes, then crossbreeding it with uh, a traditional octoploid uh, bee neutral or regular strawberry? Yeah, there's some synthetic octoploids out there. So people have made uh, um, the increased numbers of chromosomes. There's way you, ways you can do that that are pretty easy. And, uh, and people have done it and it exists, but it's a little bit rare. I mean, it, it, and it doesn't, it's very difficult to get predictable genetic gains from it. But there's people working on it all the time and maybe some big revolution will happen where we find some new products that way. Excellent. Uh, so, uh, let's see. That's one more question I can't remember. I can't think of anything else. Do you have anything else to add? Well, I, I think that it's uh, it's kind of an exciting time for people to be thinking about genetic improvement of plants. Uh, traditional breeders, the people who just are crossing genes, not any genetic engineering, they have new tools available to make the process go faster. And I think we should all be really excited about the next generation of fruits and vegetables that we'll have available and, you know, really urge people to try something unusual when they see it in the market, because there's a, a lot of interesting things that we never had access to before. So uh, eat your fruits and veggies, try the crazy ones and uh, support your local farmers. Those are really good, really good messages to end on. Thank you. I think that covers everything. Okay, well, thank you for uh, the